This is the Hockey News Podcast. Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Hockey News Podcast. It's Matt Larkin. It's Ryan Kennedy. And now returning, Ken Campbell is back on the podcast. Was it a good week off, Kenny? Or was it pretty mad? Oh, it was uh, It was great. I, it, I got a week off in the middle of the winter and the middle of a pandemic when it was either freezing cold or snowing every day. So, aces. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds splendid. Sounds splendid. But hey, at least, you know, when you're outside. Yeah. At least yeah, there's some snow. snow. Did some snowshoeing and stuff. It was, yeah, it was, it was good. To, to I got do. to play hockey on the weekend one-on-one against a, a four-year-old who, he was pretty good. Except... You know, his video goal judge was pretty lenient. They killed all, every one of my goals got called back, you know? Expand. It was, an e- it was an even match, and I was scoring some goals, but every time I scored, the goal got called back. So the four-year-old won, but I'm just saying it was closer than he believes it was. So was this in video, or was it on? Was it in real life? This is on a backyard rink. Oh, cool. Yeah, because yeah. I was. it's not, not my, my buddy's son. He wanted to play, so. Ah, awesome. What I'm saying is at least... When there's snow on the ground, you can do activities. It's better than if it's time. Call me up next time. I'll be I'll be all over that backyard rink yeah. stuff. That's why I always say March, April, worst months of the year because you don't get the snow fun factor. You just get the cold and the just the crap outside. So, speaking of crap, there's a segue for you. Uh, what is going on with our Temi Panarin? Wild accusation thrown at him coming into the KHL and specifically Andre Nazarov. Uh, claiming that he beat uh, an 18 year old woman in Latvia in 2011. Artemi Panarin leaves the Rangers, takes a leave of absence. The Rangers, of course, are saying the story is fabricated. So let's just start with the story itself. And, you know, we are speculating at this point and things could change. And, and you know, while we're recording this podcast, more information could come out, but we're trying to process what we know so far and what we know about the parties involved in making the accusations. So do you tend to believe this story or are you? so far falling on the side of Panarin. Do you think Panarin is being blackballed because he's going against, he's famously repeatedly gone against Vladimir Putin. We'll start with you, Ken. Well, I, I, I'm, I'm going to reserve judgment. I, I, you know, I mean, chances are that, that this is something that isn't true, but I think you have to take it seriously, especially when it's, when it's a, uh, you know, an accusation that, you know, that, that involves assault of a, of a, of a young woman. I think you have to take it seriously. You don't necessarily have to believe it, but I think you have to do your due diligence and look into it. You know, I, I mean, there's, there's the absence of so many things here, right? Like, I mean, this would never hold water in North America, right? I mean, you know, some, some, a third party comes out with no evidence and, and makes an accusation like that. And, and then the media just runs with it. Well, that wouldn't happen in North America, but you know, I mean, you've been to Russia, right, Ryan? I have yes yeah, once. I've, I've been there a couple of times. It's it's a different place. It's it's the the rules are are so much different there, and 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 so um, you know I th- I think it I think it's something that you have to take seriously, um, but you put it into context. And you were talking about you know the political opposition, the fact that you know there's there's essentially zero evidence, and also the alleged the alleged person who who. Uh, who was beaten up is not the person who's coming forth with the charges. So, I mean, it's, it's, it's dubious at best, but I still think it, you know, that you have to, that you have to give it some weight, let it play out and, and see where, see where everything lands. Yeah. I understand what you're saying, Ken, about the seriousness of the charges, but given what reporters have already dug up for me, it's, it's like, no, like, of course this is, fraudulent you know Nazarov is a known Putin partisan who is trying to you know cozy up to the Russian hockey establishment he knows that Panarin is on the outs uh, because of his uh, opposition to the way Navalny has been treated by Putin and his regime you know reporters have already talked to all his teammates from that year who said it never happened they've talked to the hotel that said it never happened and there was no victim that, you know, as Ken mentioned, you know, no victim has come forward. I'm not sure if there was even a name put forth by Nazarov, but we don't even know if this young woman exists. And I, for me, it's just, it's, it's too obvious a ruse to get sucked into. And I understand why Panarin is taking a leave of, of absence because 
what you know and to me you know I, I think what he sees is an escalation from this Russian establishment and you know this is a group of people that obviously um, have taken the law into their own hands in the past and you know Panarin has a family to think about and I'm sure their security is first and foremost on his mind you know I mean the backdrop of this is you know, was this Nazarov just going rogue and thinking he could curry some favor by tossing this story out there? That's probably the most likely scenario. Um, but we do have to consider that there is a Russian Olympic team that will be picked, you know, within the coming year. And if they wanted to penalize Panarin for his political views, finding a excuse to leave him off is the easiest way to do that even though Russia's going to lose in the quarterfinals to like Finland as they always do when NHLers are involved um but it just everything's too convenient uh on the the Nazarov side of the story uh whereas with Panarin I think he's doing the right thing by stepping away right now I'm sure his priorities are are elsewhere other than being on the ice and I think that's the smart thing to do. Yeah, information we have so far, and the information that we have so far, I think, is is pretty suspect. Uh, you know, Andre Nazarov's credibility, I would liken it to Jose Canseco's credibility in terms of just the reputation for being a bit of a raving lunatic. Uh, and what Andre Nazarov is probably most famous for is not his playing career, it's for, it's for attacking fans in the stands with a hockey stick. So when you hear it coming from his mouth, it's hard to take it seriously because he just has a reputation for being really out there and if anything, you know, emotionally unstable. So, and I do, I have heard the same thing, Ryan, coming out of, you know, I've seen it from some Russian reporters claiming that this is all a ploy to try and get Panarin nudged off the Olympic team as a punitive measure. And it's funny, you know, do you see a scenario where, where Panarin, who has talked about feeling less and less comfortable in Russia, becomes an American citizen and then five, 10 years from now, he competes for Team USA, how, what a crazy story that would be if he was still good enough. Um, but and the other thing too is, you know, hockey in Russia, I, there's no, I don't think I've ever seen in any country uh, such a tight connection between the sport and the government. And it's like, it's, it's so tied to the power structure that I've even noticed, like when I was doing a story on an oral history of the miracle on ice, I couldn't get anyone from team Russia to talk about it because it was a failure. It was known as a national failure. So the government blocked me from being able to even interview players just to discuss a, a famous failure of the nation. And it's happened to me before multiple times where I've been interviewing a Russian player and I won't name, name names or teams in this case, but where team officials have warned me at the last second, hey, don't talk about Putin, it's off limits. So there's like this trickle down effect even to the NHL where there's such a, a control, control would be the word. So based on all that circumstantial evidence, I find it hard to believe this story is true, but I agree with you, Ken, you know, a bombshell could drop literally while we're recording this podcast that changes everything. So we can't say for sure that he's innocent, but it's, it's, it's pretty suspect, I think, so far, the information that's out there. So staying on this for a bit longer with the Rangers, just from a hockey perspective, you know, this team, there was a lot of excitement going into the season. You have this Panarin situation. Now he's gone. You have Mika Zibanejad after an amazing season, struggling to score a goal. Alexi Lafreniere having a really poor start to his rookie season. Tony D'Angelo off the team now. So much has happened. And do you guys think this is sort of just going to be a lost season for the Rangers? We'll start with you, Kent. Yeah, I think, I think we are looking at that. And I, and I would like to point out that in our, uh, in our fantasy hockey guide, when uh, the, we did the ask the experts thing, uh, I think one of the questions was who's going to have the biggest dip in production this year. And I said, Mika's advantage ad. So there we go. Anyways, <laughs> anyways. Yeah. I mean, between that and I, I mean, I, the, the one I'm least, I would be least concerned about right now with the New York Rangers is Alexis Lavernier. I, I'm not concerned that he's not producing. I'm not concerned that he's having struggles. I mean, Joe Thornton had six goals as a rookie. You know, Guy Lafleur struggled for his first three years in the NHL. I, and I'm not saying that Alexi Lafreniere is going to become as good as either of those guys, because I don't think he is. I think he's going to be a very good player. I don't think he's ever going to be a superstar. I think he's going to be a good, you know, good, a good player, like that scores 30 to 40 goals at the height of his career. And, and I, I, don't, I don't think that's not going to happen now because of what I'm seeing. I mean, this is pretty typical of struggles of a young guy. And I, I, that's the guy I would be the least worried about, but yeah, it looks, it's looking an awful lot, like a bit of a, bit of a tire fires going on there. 
Yeah, I, I'm not going to say it's going to be an entirely lost year from the perspective of development. And, you know, Ken touched on it with Lafreniere. This is a less pressure filled situation now for him because, you know, I mean, they can still make the playoffs because they're in probably the worst division in the NHL. I mean, there's also the West that's pretty top heavy. But, I mean, they could sneak into that fourth spot and no one will be surprised. But even if they don't, it's okay at this point and because so many other things have happened that I think expectations have been brought down. What that allows is for Lafreniere to get in his first NHL season and just get the lay of the land, build up some confidence, figure out the game which is essentially what happened to Jack Hughes in New Jersey last year. You know, I talked to Jack Hughes in the off season and, you know, he said, you know, I, I don't have any regrets about my rookie year. I got into, you know, about 60 games or whatever the schedule was last year before it was cut off. He's like, now I have that experience. I bring it over to my second year. And then obviously now we've seen what Jack Hughes has been doing with the devils. Um, so for the young Rangers like Lafreniere, Capo Caco, Keandre Miller, even, you know, Adam Fox, who's a little bit older and more experienced, but still finding his way. You know, this is a chance for them to get a lot of reps, a lot of ice time, you know, maybe some special teams and just play. And it's okay because Savannah Jad's having an off year. Truba's injured now. D'Angelo's gone. Panarin is on this leave. You know, nobody expects the Rangers to go on, a 10 game winning streak. So the rookies and the young guys can do their thing. And then, you know, you reassess in the off season, you know, Zibanejad, I believe is, you know, his contract is coming up fairly soon. And I think the challenge for Jeff Gordon right now is to say, okay, how do I look down the middle long-term? Do I have a number one center right now? Because their, their best young players are not centers. They're all wingers and defensemen. And then of course, Shesterkin in net. So you say to yourself, okay, well, Philip Heedle, you know, we never really thought he was going to be a number one center. We thought he could be, you know, a pretty good number two center, but who's our number one? Do we give Zabanajad another contract? Do we need to draft another center? Do we need to trade for one? I think that's the big question. And, uh, you know, that's, that's going to be the challenge in the off season is assessing what this roster looks like in the long term. Well, Ryan, you just teed that that one up for me very nicely. It's a perfect segue to what I wanted to discuss because I, I do think it's a lost season for the Rangers, especially in this brutally tough division. You're in sixth place. There are just so many. I mean, we knew going into the season, this is the toughest division in the league. There are five, at least five really good teams, and one of those teams is going to miss. So if you're, if you're not even in the top five, I think you're really tough. You're missing so many of your key pieces. But the silver lining is the New York Rangers will pick in the first round again. And who knows where that pick's going to be. And that's another asset you can put together in your big package that you will then send to the Buffalo Sabres for Jack Eichel, because that's the player you need to take your franchise to the next level. The Rangers are one of the, the few teams that has the cap space and the young assets that they can surrender a lot and still not lose much from the starting lineup. So I'm seeing the pieces starting to fall into place for Jack Eichel, New York Ranger. We'll talk a bit more about the Sabres a bit later, but first, uh, I've noticed, you know, a lot of people who aren't Oilers or Leafs fans are getting annoyed. They're saying on Twitter, you know, I'm getting a lot of this stuff. Just, Why are you talking about Ma Austin Matthews and Connor McDavid all the time? Well, I'll tell you why we're talking about them, because Austin Matthews has scored 18 goals in his first 18 games and now 19 games, and Connor McDavid had 37 points in his past 20 games, both guys are having the biggest season statistically in terms of their pace in about 25 years. That's why we were talking about them. So shut up, stop complaining. We're going to talk about them more right now. What I want to know from you guys is, are Connor McDavid and Austin Matthews, are they officially now taking that torch? It seems like to make a Star Wars reference, there's the Master and Apprentices. There must always be two, like the Sith Lords. There's always two dueling superstars, you know, Gretzky Lemieux and Ovechkin Crosby. And it seems like McDavid Matthews are now finally ascending to that long-term throne. Do you think that's true? And do you think we are going to see generational careers that eventually culminate in, you know, discussions among, are they Hall of Famers? Are they, are they even beyond that? So we'll start with you, Ryan. I think so with a bit of a caveat that let's not forget about Nathan McKinnon 
in Colorado uh, because McKinnon, you know, he's probably on the best team right now uh, all around. I know Toronto has a, a very good record right now, but Colorado has, you know, battled through injuries and they're really starting to, you know, churn there in a positive way. And, you know, McKinnon has a great all round game. He has that speed of, McD- of McDavid. He has that power of Austin Matthews. Um, so I don't want to forget him. Um, but having said that, yeah, like it's very difficult to stop Austin Matthews. It's really, really difficult to stop Connor McDavid, um, you know, unless you're the Oshawa Generals. Shout out to uh, anybody who got, got that reference. Um, you know, we're, we're at a point now where because these guys, you know, they, they have good casts around them offensively, they can just pile up the points. And, you know, they present such problems because whether it's McDavid's speed and his ability to make plays at top speed, which is a, a pretty rare commodity even uh, amongst NHLers. And then with Matthews, it's his shot and his puck protection. There's just not a lot of ways to game plan that. And, you know, because you have Dreisaitl and you have Marner um, and you have, you know, other weapons stepping up in those on those teams like Nugent Hopkins and Darnell Nurse. And then on Toronto, you have to be worried about Tavares and Nylander as well. Um, You know, it just it pulls defenses in different directions. And I think that's why we're seeing these kids in their prime just loading up and you know maybe part of it is because they play in a division that tends to be very run and gun right now um but i know that i've seen sort of the the fancy stats folks on twitter point out that in terms of um you know goals like it's really actually pretty even in the nhl like maybe matthews and mcdavid get one or two more goals than they would have playing in another division that would still make them two of the most dynamic players in the NHL. Yeah. I mean, I think, I think actually Ryan brings up a really good point, which I, you know, I don't say very often, but he did. Um, And uh, in talking about Nathan McKinnon, I mean, I felt like when, when it was, when it was Crosby and Ovechkin, it was, it was kind of them, just them. They were in this sort of elite group by themselves, but I mean, now that, you know, I mean, minor hockey and junior hockey and college hockey, they just keep out churn, keep churning out these amazing players that I think the group gets a little bit bigger now. You know, I mean, it, it seemed like we were seeing a generational player only once every generation. And now, you know, we seem to be seeing them once every 10 years, once every five years. So I, I think the pool's a little bit bigger. Um, I think another thing you have to consider is, uh, you know, when I talk to uh, Ovechkin early in his career, and it's it's a it's a, a legendary line around the office is cups is cups, right? Um, you know, I mean, Steve Eiserman before he became the icon, Steve Eiserman. You know, there were a lot of questions about him because he hadn't led the Detroit Red Wings to a Stanley Cup, and then he went and won four of them. You know, and then you look at Ovechkin, same thing. A lot of people were questioning his all-time greatness because he was great internationally. He was great in the regular season. He won all the awards. He scored all the goals. He won all the Rocket Richard trophies, but the playoff success wasn't there. And then he finally got it. You know, Crosby, of course, it's 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 there and it's been there and it's been there for a long or sorry, that's what I mean. Crosby, it's been there for a long time. So um, but with McDavid and and Matthews, I think we've got to see that. We've we have yet to see that. I don't, you know, as much as as good as the Toronto Maple Leafs have been this season and as much as they're doing and as as special a season as they're all having, it's not going to mean a hill of beans if they don't accomplish anything in the playoffs. This team has to have a long playoff run in order for it to be taken seriously as, you know, a a team that has truly great players on it. But, you know, that being said, I'm, I'm saying it now. I've said it before. I'm going to say it again. I'm going to keep screaming it from the rooftops. Austin Matthews is is poised to become the first true superstar the Toronto Maple Leafs have ever had. Now that's, that could be an indictment of the Maple Leafs as much as it is a, a compliment to Austin Matthews. It's probably a little bit of both, but this guy is special. He shoots the puck and his release is like nothing literally that I've ever seen before, including guys like Brett Hall and, and Mike Bossy, um, you know, and Connor McDavid. I mean, I knew he was going to be in the hall of fame before he, he wasn't even was drafted. You could just tell, you just knew. Right. And, and he is going to be any, you know, I mean, he's obviously, you know, the greatest player in the world right now. So, you know, greatness awaits both of them. No question. 
Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm of the optimistic mindset with both of them that I think they both are, they really are those generational talents. And you see the parallels, you know, Gretzky and Lemieux were perceived to immediately be that upon arrival, and they were. Crosby and Ovechkin were perceived that way, and they were. And I think you see the same thing from, from McDavid and Matthews. Matthews, people might think he's arriving this year, but his actual production on a per 60 basis he was already leading the league in all these goal scoring categories the difference is Sheldon Keith plays him Mike Babcock didn't Austin Matthews playing 21 53 a game he's now getting McDavid minutes and now he's getting McDavid numbers and Matthews in his last 82 games has 68 goals only nine players in history have scored 68 goals in a full season and you're seeing McDavid 1.85 points per game and that's at the 20 game mark. So if you use that as a filter, 20 plus games, it's the most, the highest points per game by anyone since Mario Lemieux in 1995, 96. So you're seeing both guys producing at levels we truly haven't seen in 25 years. And obviously the winning has to come with it, but that's okay. Mario Lemieux didn't make the playoffs till his fifth season. He won the Stanley Cup in his seventh. Ovechkin won the Stanley Cup, and I think it was his 13th. So when we look at the total body of work, I think eventually you'll see the winning will go with the overall numbers for both players when their careers are done. I think you'll see see them each win at least a Stanley Cup. That wouldn't be surprising to me, even if it ends up, you know, if it's Matthew somewhere else when his contract's up, we don't know. But I think we are seeing that, that trajectory. They're producing at a level truly that we haven't seen since Ovechkin and Crosby when they first arrived, but maybe even further back. Maybe even guys from the 90s, when you know, in the 80s, when it was Lemieux and Gretzky in their peak. They're really doing special things. And that's why it's okay to talk about them. It is a big story. And I know it annoys people that, you know, there's so much talk from these two guys in, the, in these Canadian markets. But it's just, a, it's not about where they play. It's just about enjoying the talent and just celebrating the greatness, celebrating that we're seeing things we truly haven't seen in two and a half decades. So I'm a believer of generational talents. They both are. And McKinnon, to me, it's like, if, if, if McDavid is Gretzky and, and, and Matthews is Lemieux, McKinnon is Steve Eiserman, the guy that was putting up unbelievable numbers just below them, but got overshadowed. So he never got those big individual acc accolades. Um, let's talk Buffalo Sabres. So this week is the 10 year anniversary of Terry Pagula buying the Sabres. And over that span, uh, they did make the playoffs that year. But if you don't count that, they're about to, they're probably going to miss the playoffs a 10th straight time, which will tie the NHL record. They have the worst points percentage in the NHL since Terry Pagula took over as an owner. So what I want to know is, will these guys ever be good under Pagula? Do you blame ownership or is it just hard luck? We've seen six coaches and four GMs, I believe, during Pagula's tenure. So, Ryan, I know you've covered a lot of what Pagula Pugula has done, especially because of what he's done on the NCAA side. So I'll give you a problem in Buffalo. Yeah, I think that Buffalo can have success under the Pagulas if the Pagulas just let the Sabres be. You know, you mentioned six coaches, four GMs, and uh, that to me is not bad luck. Uh, that starts at the top. And, you know, I'll, I'll look at another uh, team in the NHL that's sort of in a similar situation, the Anaheim Ducks. How often do we hear about Henry and Susan Samueli. Like, never. But they have a Stanley Cup, and, you know, they're rebuilding right now, but they have an exciting rebuild. You know, Trevor Zegers just came up. They've got some other guys in San Diego that are very exciting, like Jamie Drysdale uh, and Jacob Perot. Henry and Su Susan Samueli, uh, they are owners, but they basically hire people, and they let those people do, do their job, and that's that. And the Anaheim Ducks have been a, a pretty good franchise during their stewardship. I think in Buffalo, you know, is, is Kevin Adams the guy? Maybe. Let's see what he can do. Um, you know, the circumstances of his hiring wasn't ideal uh, when they essentially fired, you know, 80% of their hockey operations department. I just, if they're hands off, everything will be fine. Uh, you know, trust the people that you put in power, go find some shale or whatever natural gas or oil, um, you know, the Pagulas are, are famous for mining, go do that. Uh, <laughs> or concentrate on the Bills. I'm sure Bills fans don't want to hear that. Um, but just leave the Sabres alone. Owners, you own the team, you hire the people to run them and you step away. 
Yeah, I, I feel like in Buffalo, the problem there is the Pugulas can't even can't get out of their own way. You know, like they, they, they're and, and there's always way more drama in Buffalo than there should be, you know, like for a market its size, like it just it, it leads the league in drama and it and it and it and it's one of the worst teams in the league. Um, you know, and and it's funny that you did bring up the Buffalo Bills, Brian, because I think I look at the Pagula situation in Buffalo and I look at the Buffalo Bills and I see a reason for hope. But why, why are the Buffalo Bills good? Because they brought in Brandon Bean as the general manager and they allowed him to do his job and he put together a roster that's an elite team in the NFL and, and is a Super Bowl contender. And they have a really good coach in Sean McDermott. You know, and they've been they've been the guys like, you don't I don't know. I don't I mean, I don't follow the NFL closely enough to, to know. But it seems to me that when it comes to the Buffalo Bills, you don't hear about the Pagulas as much as you do when you when you're talking about the, the Buffalo Sabres. Right. And I've learned this in the 35 years that I've been covering this game and involved in this game. There's one thing that has been drilled into my head. It doesn't matter what the size of the market is. It doesn't matter anything it doesn't matter you know where you are where you're located it all starts at the top and when i mean the top i mean the top with ownership unless you have stable ownership that is prepared to spend use its resources and spend money on people and allow them to do your jobs you are not going to be successful we've seen it time and again with teams that should be much better like the Toronto Maple Leafs and the New York Rangers and you know they they don't they don't do it and then you see teams like the Tampa Bay Lightning with Jeff Vinnick who who's probably the poster boy for NHL owners now um, you know and that's an organization that is just coming off the Stanley Cup so i think the first thing they have to do the Pagulas have to do is to learn to get out of their own way and I think the second thing that this organization screams for is a president of hockey operations, someone to provide that buffer, someone to be the guy or, or woman in this case, because now we're getting a lot of qualified women um, in the game, you know, to be that person that mentors the GM that, that, you know, sort of heads up the hockey department and is the buffer between the GM and ownership, you know, kind of like, and I, I don't know if it's going to work out, but kind of like a, a Brian Burke in Pittsburgh. Um, that kind of thing. I think that, that, that this organization is screaming out for that. It's screaming out for someone that has, some, has, has, a, has a, a resume of stability and good, you know, good, uh, and, and good decisions and those sorts of things. You know, maybe it's not a fit, but is it Jim Rutherford? He's going to be, he's going to be a free and, but Jim's been a guy who's been a cowboy who's made a lot of changes and maybe what you need more than anything is stability in Buffalo, but maybe somebody like that comes in as the president of hockey operations. Interesting. It, it's, he it makes really good points, Ken. And I'm glad you mentioned Jeff Vinnick because it's tough. You know, you own something, you love it. Ideally you want to be part of it. It's understandable. So you see, you know, the Sabres under, under the Pagula era, they haven't been afraid to take chances, spend money, you know, Vili Leno, Christian Erhoff, Kyle Ocpozo, Jeff Skinner, these contracts just blow up and the heart, from ownerships in the right place. Like, hey, we're we're going to put some money into this. We're going to try to win. But if you look at the correlations length and not care, because obviously Jeff Vinnick is known as probably the most caring owner in the league, it's that you have to back away on the actual hockey decisions. So Vinnick is known as a really involved owner with you know community outreach and just building the area around the arena making that making this the lightning a better business a better team people want to be around but no one talks about you know Jeff Vinnick and the lightning's cap crunch no it's, it's Julian Brisebois when when it comes when it comes to personnel decisions but hockey with the Sabres you're always hearing about the ownership and that to me is the problem it is too hands-on like you said Ken you need that buffer zone because there seems to be a culture of micromanagement there. It's okay to love your team, but you have to, I think, if you really love your team, set it free on the hockey side and find other ways to be involved with the franchise and promote it and make it a, a, something that people want to enjoy as entertainment. And I do think, you know, we're reaching a point. I mean, I wrote about it online last week, but we're probably going to have to see some crazy turnover again on the hockey side, whether it's finding some kind of team to take Jeff Skinner's contract whether it's trading Eichel it seems like we're heading that way and that's going to be future pieces and I think we're going to see the Buffalo Sabres set not just tie the NHL record but set the NHL record next year 
with an 11th straight playoff miss. It's sad to see. And I know that, I mean, I don't see Pagula as a guy that, you know, it's not a situation. It's not pinching pennies. It's not, not caring. I think it is caring, but it's maybe just caring too much. Mm-hmm. Next up, let's talk a little bit about Sidney Crosby. We've touched on him a little bit already today, but let's get more specific. He reached the thousand game mark and, you know, I don't want to give away too much. We're going to have a project coming up in the months to come that we'll touch on some all-time great players but i do want to talk specifically about sit and all-time list ryan i would put him fourth overall right now i would go gretzky or lemieux crosby and you know when i think about these things i always like to play the game of who could shut down who And I think that, you know, Crosby is at the point where if you had Crosby versus Gordie Howe in their primes, Crosby could score on Gordie Howe. Gordie Howe could not score on Crosby. Same with Maurice Richard. Um, Same with even Nick Lidstrom. And I would put Nick Lidstrom very high on that list as well, because I tend to be a futurist and believe that as time has gone on, it's harder and harder to uh, to put up numbers and to have success in the NHL because your opponents are no longer smoking between periods and only come from like three different cities. Um, so uh, given all that, you know, I, I recognize the excellence of Gretzky Orr and Lemieux and what they did in their eras uh, was still incredible. You know, like Orr won the scoring race one year as a defenseman. That's just incredible. Um, and Lemieux, I think, you know, just because of his combination of skill and size, you know, he was just, uh, I mean, he was just incredible. I, I think even Crosby would have had trouble slowing Lemieux down. But other than that, like, I don't see anybody in hockey history that could really hold a candle to Sid at this point. Yeah, it's it's a it's a real interesting conversation, I think, and and people have been having it like it was it was a big conversation on Hockey Night Canada this weekend. Is Sid Sidney Crosby a top five player? Um, I I think he probably is. Um, you know, I I I would be leaning towards sliding him in at number four, the same spot you do. But then I look and maybe it's my Montreal Canadiens bias, but I'm not sure if I can put him at this point ahead of Jean Beliveau. And then what do you do with Rocket Richard at, 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 in there? Then that knocks him out of the top five, which I'm not, I'm okay with, um, you know, but, but it's, it's very, very difficult to keep him out of the top five. I think he has been a guy that, you know, came in with enormous expectations and has, you know, you could probably argue that he's exceeded them, um, that he's been even better than I think people thought he was going to be. Um, you know, and now he's, you know, now he's obviously on the decline. I don't think there's any secret there. He's not the player he was 10 years ago. And, and, but he, but he's found a way to still be, you know, the, 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 the engine that, that drives that team. And, uh, you know, he's much more of a two-way presence. He's got, you know, he's got his con Smythes. Um, you know, there are a lot of people that argue the first year, probably Phil Kessel should have won the con Smythe. Maybe. You know, maybe, but, but, but I mean, he's got, you know, he ticks off all the boxes for an all time superstar, great player. So as difficult as it would be, I'd have to find a place in the top five for him. I I don't think there's any question about that. I've got him slotted in at exactly five. So I have Gretzky one or two, Lemieux three, how four. And I think Crosby's right there. I think the only thing that keeps Crosby apart from those four is that that for they all had sustained periods of not just winning but st- but statistical pure dominance. Crosby had some good flashes of it. He won two scoring titles. He won a couple MVPs. But his statistical peak came right as his concussions hit. And that one season where he played half a year, that was his. He was on pace for I think 132 points, which would have been the most points since 95, 96. And his so he missed the, that supernova portion of his career where he might have been lapping the field for several seasons. So you get a really good career offensively, elite, but I think where Crosby gets into the top five for me is that he's a consummate winner. He's got the three cups, the two consmites. Only Patrick Waugh has more consmite trophies. He's got two gold medals, scored the game-winning goal at two different Olympics. And to me, Crosby's on the short list. If you have to win a game seven, 
you have to have one superstar. He's right there. And, you know, he has the elite skill of the generational talents, like whether it's Lemieux Gretzky, but he also has the kind of fiery competitive winner reputation of a Mark Messier or Peter Forsberg combined into that skill set. So that's why I think I feel pretty confident having him slotted in at number five all time. So Lake Tahoe, we saw on the weekend, it looked beautiful. <laughs> there were some technical difficulties with that ice. They were playing at all hours of the night. But I, I still think that, that the, the rink left an impression. People thought it was very aesthetically striking. Now there's talk about a game on Lake Louise, that kind of thing. So do you guys, do you have interest in seeing this new trend, possible trend of fewer fans, but cooler environment? Or do you think if the NHL does outdoor games again, you know, post COVID, that it should go back to the big venues with lots of fans? Ken? Well, I'll, I'll start this by saying that I, I have no use for outdoor games. <laughs> um, I, I, I honestly, I have no use for outdoor games. And I thought, you know, as wonderful as it was, I thought this week, weekend was an embarrassment and a debacle for the NHL. I, I mean, how, if, if you're trying to get new fans to watch the game, to get casual sports fans to watch this game, you show them one period where people are falling all over the ice and the puck is bouncing everywhere. You wait an hour or so, and then you tell them, oh yeah, come back at midnight and watch the rest of the game. Like, no, no, like th that's full stop. That's a debacle. And, and like, to me, how you can have the game at noon, a local time in Lake Tahoe, it took me two seconds to find, to type in what's the average temperature in Lake Tahoe in February. And it's plus seven. And you have a game at noon in, at the highest where the sun's at its most powerful point of the day in a place that's plus seven usually, the ice is crap, and then you come on and say, the sun is our enemy. Sorry, don't get any of it. Anyways, um, I've never been an outdoor games guy. I have no interest in going and sitting through that stuff. I think it's a terrible television spectacle. I think it's great for a local fan base. I think it's great when you can, you know, have 100,000 fans of, you know, the Detroit Red Wings and the Toronto Maple Leafs at the big house, you know, that kind of stuff. I think that's great. But as a television spectacle, I don't think it, it works. And I, I, I just, I guess what I'm saying is they'll probably go back to the big ones because they're going to have to make up a ton of revenues here, guys. Like they're losing tons of money, as we all know. Revenues are cratering because of the pandemic, both last year and this year. They're going to need a way to, to regain a lot of those revenues. And, and I mean, this, this would be a way as, you know, putting 100,000 people into a into a football stadium. So I, I see that as probably the way they're going to go, but I, I don't really know. And, you know, I don't really care to be honest with you. <laughs> yeah. I, th I think the way forward is probably a hybrid of the two. And I mean, I'll disagree with you, Ken, on one thing, you know, as a TV event and, and maybe more just so from an aesthetic event, I think Tahoe was a huge win because everybody was, you know, retweeting pictures of the scene itself. I mean, you're totally right about the actual gameplay, and that's something they'll obviously have to work on in the future. But I think we're going to see a hybrid, and I'm going to blog about this. Um, I can see there being sort of boutique events in the future where you kind of cater to the 1% crowd, and you make it this sort of like resorty getaway where like maybe you have a game in Alaska at some sort of like cool, like fishing resort or whatever, or hunting resort, where you build the rink up there. Attendance is like a thousand, 2000 people, but everybody pays like 10 grand to do it. And you get some other free stuff, whatever, you know, you get a bunch of sponsors and, you know, all that good stuff for people that are not us. Um, and you make sure they're warm in their little seats. You give them blankets and such. It's cool for the players because it's it's outdoors. You have amazing scenery. You know, it's great for Instagram. It's great for Twitter because you're going to have all this crazy nature. Maybe a couple elk run by uh, in the second period. Who knows? Um, I think that is one way forward where you can get people excited. You can make it this event where you don't have to have it in a major urban center and you can really, really concentrate the event on what you need to be done so you know for example the quality of the ice you can really you know make sure that you have what you need to make that happen 
having said that, I think you're going to see some more big stadium games uh, because of what Ken pointed out with the revenues. And, and also they kind of owe some markets. You know, Carolina, for example, was supposed to have a game at NC State's uh, football stadium this year. And obviously that got delayed um, because of everything that's been going on. So they kind of owe them a game at, I think it's called Carter Finley Stadium. So you, you know you're going to see that. There's probably going to be a couple more in that vein where, you know, you want to get some other markets into outdoor games. You know, I think, you know, Tampa Bay would be an obvious one um, where even if it's obviously not in Tampa Bay, um, you know, you want to get them into a game where uh, their fans can travel and, and you get the big TV, you know, uh, spectacle there. So I, I think we're going to see more of them. It's funny. I've never been to an outdoor game because I'm always at the world juniors when the big ones happen. Um, but, you know, I mean, it seems to be fun for a lot of fans. And I think if you, if you have the boutique events and then you have some of the more run of the mill ones that we've seen already, it'd be good for revenue. And it, it would, it would help the league's profile overall. Mm -hmm. well said by the way american listeners can reference seven degrees that's celsius i think yeah, that's like high right. 40s if right. you're wondering yeah. I, I, th I think that's roughly good high point. 40s good point yeah uh, but yeah you guys make good points I, I think we're likely to see it at least one more time because of the novelty the aesthetics i think it might be lake louise i think the nhl will want to try it again to see if they can execute it in a climate where the temperature is more reliable and consistent so lake louise would be a good example but overall I don't think it's going to be a long-term trend because the big outdoor games, you know, where you have hundred, almost hundred thousand people or you did it in Michigan. I read it was, I think it was Sean Shapiro from the athletic was reporting this week. Those games turn about $5 million in profit on average. So if you're doing the small scale event without the gate revenues, you're really relying on big time sponsorship deals and you desperately need really good TV ratings. It's hard to judge the TV ratings that we that we're going to get from Lake Tahoe because obviously the games were all chopped up into pieces and then moved to another network, I believe. Uh, so we can't really assess how good the ratings were, but you really need to have an absolute gangbusters event to make it worthwhile with the sponsorship, ad revenue, all that kind of stuff. So I think eventually the NHL will have to go back to filling venues with a lot of seats when COVID allows it. Uh, let's do a couple listener questions. Uh, we had multiple questions about this topic, one from Magic and one from Karazen, Go Habs Go. They both want to know, Will Claude Julien be fired soon? Ken, you can start with this one because I know you wrote about it this week. I don't think it's anything imminent, but I mean, I think, you know, you've got to wonder how long the leash is going to be here. I mean, it, you know, GM Mark Bergevin is, is, has, has a reputation for being very patient with coaches. Um, I think what worries me more about the Canadians and the, the future of Claude Julien is just, how do they want to play and are they on the same page? I mean, you, you know, you see Nick Suzuki coming out and saying, you know, we're inside our own heads, you know, we're playing not to lose, you know, that sort of thing. And then Claude Julien basically says, we got to play not to lose. We got to play a stable, you know, game, blah, blah, blah. You know, like, like, I mean, I think sometimes you got to read the room <laughs> and look at what division you're in. And, you know, I mean, maybe that stable patient game where, you obviously suffer offensively big time when you when you don't turn your guys loose. Uh, isn't the way to play this year in that division, um, you know? And I mean, I mean, I'm sure that there there seems to be a very vocal segment of the Montreal fan base that wants to see Claude Julien gone. Um, I don't think that's I don't think that's much of a secret, um, you know. And I mean, he was there in 2017. Since then, they made the playoffs, lost in the first round missed the playoffs in the next two years, would have missed last year if not for the pandemic, and then went on, obviously, that enormous run. Um, you know, I, I'm, is it, is it, uh, is it, is it Claude Julien's fault that Carey Price has regressed back to being what Carey Price was last year during the regular season? That, you know, Thomas Tatar, Phil Deneau, Brendan Gallagher are all struggling. Shea Weber is, looks, really really slow and you know i mean none of those are his fault but and you know i don't think you can expect you know nick suzuki and yasperi cock and cock and yemi to to you know pick this team up by its bootstraps and carry it for now um but you got to wonder about the way they play the game the first 10 games they were playing with a lot of confidence they were seven one and two they had 44 goals they were leading the league in in, in goals and now all of a sudden it's almost the polar opposite of that um, so what's changed? Well, you know, it seems like 
they're all tightening up and, and I'm not sure that's the way to play this year in that division. Mm. I think that this is the crucial season uh, for Claude Julien in Montreal, because if you think like, let's assume we go back to normal divisions next year, all of a sudden Montreal is once again on the bubble because you have Tampa Bay, Boston, Toronto, and now Florida who is, and the Panthers are looking like they're for real now. Now have them ahead of Montreal and you're probably not a playoff team. Maybe you snag the wild card spot, but you're leaving that up to chance as it is now, if they miss the playoffs this year, then I think something has to change. And because Mark Bergevin has the advantage of firing Claude Julian and not the other way around. um, I think, you know, Julian would be the first to go unless ownership says, okay, you know, this team is not, composed in a way where we can have success right now you know Montreal has some great young players uh coming up the pipeline we've already seen some of them uh with Suzuki and you know Romanoff is there already um they have a nice pipeline where they're gonna have Cole Caulfield you know Jaden Struble and Jordan Harris are very intriguing Caden Gooley um so young players are coming up so if the Canadians do fire close Julian the one advantage they have right now is they actually have somebody in waiting who would be perfect. And that is Dominique Ducharme. Great young coach already on the bench as an assistant um, has worked with young players before in the junior ranks uh, where he had fantastic success in the Quebec league. He's right there for you. He's a perfect candidate. I think he's, you know, sort of one of those like next in line kind of guys so if you decide to go another way, you've got your guy already. And that has obviously been a problem in Montreal in the past is they couldn't find the right fit. Mm-hmm. I, I don't think it's, it's time to panic yet. You know, they have their four five and one in their past 10. It's not like they've lost, you know, seven games in a row. And I think if you look at the root of the problems, uh, what I see is personnel, not coaching. Uh, you know, yes, Claude Julien, he's a little bit, he gets stale with his lines. He really doesn't juggle them very much, but what he's known for doing is rolling four lines. And why do you roll four lines? Because you don't have a dominant superstar talent. You're a deep team, but you're a team that doesn't have a star. Even if you look at Nick Suzuki, people are saying the next Patrice Bergeron. That's right. They're not saying the next Sidney Crosby. They're saying the next Patrice Bergeron, who's a great player, but I'm talking about that dominant player who can lead the league. in scoring. Habs don't have one. Cole Caulfield has potential, at least as a goal scorer, but up the middle, you don't have that other season. And I think what you're seeing with the Habs right now, you know, they're still actually generating tons of chances, shots, high danger chances. All that stuff is still excellent. They're still near the top of the league. But in February, shooting percentage is 21st. And if you have a lot of chances and a low shooting percentage, what does that say? You have no finish. They don't have finish. Tyler Toffoli was playing a bit over his head. But overall, this is a team that is good, is deep, does not have elite players offensively. And I think that's the problem. When you go in a slump, you just you start chasing it and you don't have that guy that can just take the team on his back and put up a four-point night. The Habs don't have that guy right now. I don't know where they're going to find him because I don't think he's in the system. Maybe it's Caulfield, but as a winger, I'm just not sure. So I just think this is who the Habs are. They're a good team. They're a deep team, but they're just not going to be a juggernaut. And I think they sort of were miscast in the first month as a juggernaut. We'll do one more question. This is from Scott Baker. Scott Baker says, at what point do you see Gary Bettman retiring and who is the replacement? Is Bill Daly already preordained as the next commissioner? And can you comment on Gary Bettman's tenure? So, so Gary Bettman is 68 years old. Uh, as far as I know, he's has no interest in retiring. I've heard nothing to say he's planning to retire. I assume that Bill Daly will be the next commissioner if he wants the job. He's very respected around the league. I haven't heard any reports of someone else being his successor. And as for Bet, but I think he's a massively successful commissioner. His goal is to appease the owners. The owners absolutely love him. He's brought revenues and TV ratings, everything to all time highs. If you exclude, of course, the effect of COVID. And, you know, he's been a dominator during labor negotiations. The owner come out on top every single time so in terms of actually fulfilling his job description i think gary bettman's been unbelievably good at his job he's also brought nhlers to the olympics during his tenure so i'm not saying i I love gary bettman i'm just saying objectively he's done a fantastic job at what he's supposed to do what say you ryan 
Yeah, I think he's done a, a very good job because we always have to remember that he works for the owners. Um, and it's tough because, you know, in sports, we love the teams and we love the players. We don't care about the owners, uh, but they are the ones that pay the tab. And unfortunately, during Bettman's tenure, that's been marked by lockouts, uh, which are the owner's fault. Um, so, you know, it's, it's been tough for the sport. I think the sport probably could have grown more uh, if he had taken a different tack on a couple of different things. Um, but it is growing and uh, there's still a lot of room for international growth. Now, again, you know, with the Olympics, uh, not going last time, probably hurt their international exposure. And we think they're going to China, but I don't think that's 100% right now. So we, we have to wait on that. I would say I can see Ben being here for another like five years. Um, you know, maybe a little bit long, maybe he goes until he's 75 because he's going to want to leave things in really good shape. And because of the pandemic, which obviously is not his fault, there's going to be some rough patches. We know revenues are cratering, as we mentioned earlier in the podcast. So there's going to be some time where things get back up to sort of working speed. And, you know, Seattle coming in, um, you know, he's going to want to be there for the few, first few years of that franchise, make sure everything's smooth there. And, you know, it's set up to be a success with the Kraken. But I, I'm sure he's going to want to see them. And then after that, I think things will probably be in a stable place. Um, you know, as for his, his successor, I mean, Bill Daly is the obvious one. I'm not sure if he has the particular um, personality for that job. It seems like he's excellent at what he's doing right now because, you know, being the second in command involves a lot of communication uh, with the players and the players association. And, and Bill Daly is very good at that. You know, a, a couple of names I'll throw out there that I've just kind of heard in the past year or two, you know, Mike Liut, uh, who is an agent with Octagon right now, uh, who have, you know, a, a lot of top NHLers like Vladimir Tarasenko, Mark andre Fleury, you know, guys like that. He, you know, he works with Alan Walsh. Um, you know, Mike Liut, very highly respected, a former player, uh, but very astute on the business side as well. Uh, there's also Scott O'Neill uh, with the New Jersey Devils, you know, another guy coming from a business background. Um, obviously, you know, um, the, the group that owns the Devils also owns the Philadelphia 76ers of the NBA. So his sports knowledge is more broad. You know, he can take lessons from professional basketball and apply them to the hockey world on the business side. So those are sort of two other names to, to keep in mind. And, uh, and obviously with the two of them, um, you know, they're, they're younger than Batman, which obviously helps as well. Well, if I'm not mistaken, the current CBA was extended, was it four years or five? It, I, I believe it, it expires after the 25-26 season. I don't see Gary Bettman going anywhere before then. Uh, I, I see him seeing this one through and almost certainly putting into place another long-term agreement after that. So you're looking at probably at least five or six more years uh, of Gary Bettman's regime. I don't think he has any appetite to step down. I don't think he has any appetite to slow down. Um, you know, I mean, it, it, and you think about it, if, if, if you were going to pull a pin on your, on your commissionership, you might want to do it be, you know, around now when you're going through the absolute worst time in the history of your game economically, probably, um, you know, so, and he's, he's going to get them through this, um, you know, as for his legacy, I agree with you, Matt. I think the, the fact that they pulled off the season last year in the bubble, without any positive tests and they were able to do it was absolutely brilliant. Um, you know, I, I think that that was, that, that was a huge, that's going to be a huge part of Gary Bettman's legacy. You know, when he came in, revenues were $400 million a year. They're now in a normal season when there's not a pandemic over $5 billion a year. You know, that's like, he's raised revenues by, 1300% or something like that. You know, I mean, the, you know, expansion for the most part 
has been very successful. You know, he's made a lot of money. He's been pretty progressive. Um, you know, I think there's some places that he's on the wrong side of history for sure. Um, you know, with concussions, I believe he's on the, he's going to be on the wrong side of history. I really do believe that. Um, and, uh, you know, and, and that sort of thing, but, you know, generally speaking, I'm not sure there's anybody over the last 25 years who would have done a better job than Gary Bettman has done, uh, to this point. Alrighty. We're going to finish off the podcast with the rapid fire game. Ken is the rapid fire host, and no. Ryan, you'll be the no. first answer. No, Ryan's Ryan. the host, isn't he? Oh, sorry, yeah, Ryan's yeah. rapid fire. Don't host. scare me like that. <laughs> I, I just wanted to scare Ken. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, so yeah. Ryan, that was the first the question. Host. Yeah. <laughs> uh, right. Ken, you will answer first. I will answer second with my laggy connection, and we'll try to get this rapid fire game done in a medium speed. Let's begin the game. All right, I feel like I'm being nice this week. Uh, so first question, what is your favorite song by The Clash? Uh, it's It's gotta be Rock the Casbah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, what's the song about Days of the Week? Isn't that The Clash? That's The Cure. <laughs> oh. Yeah. oh, come on. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not. That's, that's, music Friday, music, that's so. Friday. I'm in love. That's the one you're. Yeah, I thought that was yeah. the class. That's the no, that's secure. Uh, eh. right. That's still my answer. <laughs> wow, 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 posers. Um, I thought this was going to be an easier question because you have like, yeah, you have Rock the Casbah, you have you know London Calling, like yeah, yeah. Tommy oh, giving you a lot of calling. options. Yeah. Anyways, okay, I'm going Guns of Brixton. Although Police and Deeds has been stuck in my head for a lot uh lately moving on how many goals does jack eichel score this season he currently has two if i am not mistaken 17 i'll say 15 and while i have the floor i'm just gonna say it's not that i don't know those clash songs i just don't know song titles so if you played them for me i'd be like oh yeah that song i like that song so i know the songs i just gotcha. I never go know song that, titles. yeah go with that all right yeah. For sure. Yeah. Okay. Well, you're lucky you had the correct answer, which is 15. Uh, moving on. What is your favorite Wes Anderson film? That one where about the guy that did the thing. I have, I don't even know who Wes Anderson is. I'm done. Life I'm Aquatic, Brian Bombs, Rushmore. Yeah. You're still, yeah. Keep going. Keep really? going. Keep going. Yep. Yeah, the one where the guy did the thing about the thing and the fantastic understanding, Fox. and then they fell in love, and then they fell out of love, and then then by the end got back together. That one. Wow. I will say the life. We're, we're all sitting at home all day. There's nothing. <laughs> you're not watching any movies, anyways. All right, Matt, you'll have an answer for this. Yes, my answer is The Life Aquatic. It has a special place in my heart. For Halloween in 2005, me and all my buddies in university went as Team Zizu. We got a little out of control. In, in London, Ontario, nice. but we had the full decked out costumes. Love the Life Aquatic. Nice. That's a good one. I It's a toss up for me between the Life Aquatic and the Royal Tenenbaums. Since you said Life Aquatic, I'll go Royal Tenenbaums, uh, but they're both right up there. Uh, uh, if I knew that he had done the Royal Tenenbaums, I would have said the Royal Tenenbaums. That was a brilliant there movie. You go. That movie. Okay. So that'll be my. I answer. figured as much. All right. Okay. Who finishes the NHL season with more points? The Rangers, Islanders, or Devils? Out of those three teams? Yeah. I'm still no, gonna, out I'm of gonna every say team. The I'm gonna still say the Islanders. Yeah, I'm, I'm gonna I've got some faith in in, you know, I know they're struggling, but I, I think I think that they're gonna pull it together. All right. But yeah. none of them, those those might be the three teams that don't make the playoffs in that division. True. <laughs> I will also say the Islanders. I'm not saying they're going to be gangbusters, but I think they're going to be better than the Rangers and Devils. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, just to be different, I'm going to say the Devils. I feel they've got a little bit upside and, you know, they can ride Mackenzie Blackwood. Uh, similarly, which California team finishes the season with the most points? The Kings. I mean, I think they're obviously trending in the right direction right now. I, and I think, you know, I mean, Anaheim's last in that division. San Jose is whatever it is that they're doing yeah I, I i think i think the team with you know the most talent the you know the, the one that's trending in the best direction is the kings mm. 
I said the Kings before the season. I had them as a sleeper to get into a playoff spot. I still feel that way. I think they're the best California team. Gotcha. The correct answer is who cares? Because none of them are going to make the playoff uh, unless Minnesota completely collapses, which I suppose is a very real possibility. Uh, final question. What is your go karaoke song? Oh, no, no question. Copacabana by Barry Manilow. Nice. I have many group setting it's Bohemian Rhapsody or I want it that way by the Backstreet Boys. If it's solo, uh, I'll say space oddity, David Bowie or uh, want a dead or alive Bon Jovi. Interesting. Mine is also Bon Jovi living on a prayer. Can't hit that bridge octave change like I used to, but if you don't almost pass out, then it's not really karaoke rapid fire over. All righty. Well, that will conclude the podcast for this week. Hope you guys enjoyed it. And go out there, stop complaining about Connor McDavid and Austin Matthews. Go enjoy the greatness. Just soak in the fun. Stop whining. Thank you for listening and watching. Thank you for listening to the Hockey News Podcast. Make sure to check out thn.com slash subscribe to get issues of the Hockey News Magazine delivered right to your mailbox. 